So, uh, Michael, what is your writing background or your theater background? <laughs> um, I, when, when I turned 18, I moved to New York City and uh, I went to NYU and studied acting with Stella Adler, um, who was kind of a legendary teacher. Uh, she, you might have heard of some of her pupils, uh, Marlon Brando, Robert De Niro, yeah. <laughs> people like that. I mean, she was uh, with, with Lee Strasberg, was one of the preeminent teachers out there. So it was a real honor to work with her. Um, and I did acting for a bit, uh, and I quit school midway through because I thought, well, if I'm going to be an actor, I just want to act. Um, and I continued studying with Stella uh, privately. Um, but then it became clear over time that I, I was a, I was a good act. And when I was good, I was really good. Um, but I was very uneven. <laughs> um, and if, you know, depending, the bigger the character, the better I was. Um, and, you know, subtlety was not my, my forte. Um, so I was doing a lot of writing and, um, and I got a job, a temp job of all things, working at the dramatist guild. And suddenly I was, on a first name basis with people like, uh, you know, all the top, uh, I'm trying to think now, I can't think of a single name, but you know, the Neil Simons, the uh, uh, Edward Albee, Arthur Kopit, Stephen Sondheim, people like that. Uh, I was kind of in that orbit and, and was able to see any show I wanted in New York for free. So it was like a kid in a candy store. I just saw a lot of theater and realized writing is really what I wanted to do. So I went back to NYU and I got a degree in um, uh, 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 in a BFA in um, dramatic writing. They have a dramatic writing program. Uh, and then I stopped doing that and I got sucked into the music industry <laughs> and fancy that I was gonna become the next international pop star. Uh, did demo recordings. I worked at Arista Records. I was an executive assistant to Clive Davis, of all things, for a, a couple of years. And, um, and then just kind of left New York and didn't write until um, my son was born, uh, which is he's now 14. So this would be 14 years ago. Um, I just thought it was something I wanted to get back to. And I thought I've got a kid. I need to not only for, you know, for myself, but I want to be an example uh, to my son. Uh, so I started writing again. And, and so, you know, in my late forties, um, I resumed, I picked up the, you know, where I left off and, uh, and, and have had some successes, you know, not big successes, uh, but, uh, you know, recognition along the way for my first two, three plays. So. Wow. And what inspired you to tell this particular story? Well, I think as a writer, you're always um, looking for, you know, a story. And 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 um, my friend David had sent me a link to a BBC uh, series called "The Worst Places in the World to Be Gay." It's a terrible title, uh, but one of the episodes was about Uganda, and I was so fascinated. And then I found out there was a documentary called "Call Me Puchu." Puchu is a uh, Ugandan word for, for gays. Um, and I was just riveted by it too. And I thought about it a long time. I'm one of those writers too, where it's not like, oh, I'm gonna write about COVID now. Oh, I'm gonna, you know, let's write about child you know, sex trafficking. Um, it, I, there has to be a, a personal reason and a compelling reason for me to tell the story, A, but also to personalize it. And so one of the characters in the documentary uh, named Naomi, I took the name for one of my characters, um, she, she fled and, and, and applied for political asylum in Sweden. And some of the footage you saw of her was in her new home in Sweden. I thought, well, that's a culture shock to go from Africa to, to Sweden. Um, and I thought, what would it be like? And then I just thought too, what if, you know, uh, someone in, let's say we, someone came to the States and actually fell in love with someone. Could two people from si such disparate um, backgrounds make a go of it as a couple? Could, could that work? I mean, could it work with such, like I said, hugely uh, significant uh, cultural backgrounds? Could they make a go of it really? 
uh, and I wanted to explore that. And there's a lot of Matthew, uh, the, the character who's a, a, a Jewish ACLU worker, which you know I'm not Jewish or an ACLU worker, but there's a lot of me in the character of Matthew. So I was able to kind of explore my issues with relationships and intimacy and fear of intimacy uh, through this thing. And so I found my way into it. Um, if it were just a story about Ugandans, I wouldn't have told that story. That's not my story to tell. But this, this I was able to find my personal way into it and also illuminate this topic that's very near and dear to my heart. It's something I feel very passionately about. I mean, LGBTQ plus rights everywhere. Uh, but what, what was going on in Uganda was such a perfect example of, of what can happen, you know, in terms of it, it really was fueled by American evangelicals in Uganda because up to then it had not really been the radar and suddenly it was an issue. And, and American evangelists made Uganda ground zero for anti-LGBT laws. Um, and I just thought, well, that kind of says a lot about what's going on elsewhere too, because certainly the, the far right here in this country, uh, if they had their way, uh, they would criminalize it as well. Clarion, what drew you to this play? Like, how did you discover it? Well, um, basically what happened is uh, Carolwood Players Theater decided to do a staged reading of it. Um, and I think that came to them through Barry Silver, who I have not met, um, but uh, who worked with uh, Josh Goff, who I've directed before. Um, and then TR, who's part of Outcast, was cast in it. Um, and while they were working on this staged reading, uh, Josh Goff texted me and he's like, you have to direct this play. And I was like, <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll sit down and read it. Um, and I, I was blown away. Honestly, I couldn't put it down. Um, and the story was so, it's so moving, so funny. The writing, the writing is so good, Michael. I've told you that in person um, to your face before, but it, it, it's just, it's a beautifully crafted story. Um, and that's, that's the first thing I fall in love with is story, right? And the characters um, who embody that story. And these characters were so fresh, so alive. And in so many ways, it was such a beautiful revelation of how some of the structural um, oppression, because I'm always looking for oppression, you know I am, how sort of these structural issues come to bear on interpersonal relationships. It was so beautifully executed in a way that is not heavy handed, um, that isn't that, you know, mallet hitting you over the head, that it is a nuanced expression of human interaction. And what happens to human interaction when we look at um, these different cultures and these different issues floating over our head um, and how that impacts individuals and in interpersonal relationships. So I just, I straight fell in love is, is basically what happened, much like, much like a couple of the characters straight fall in love. Um, and that's, um, so I had to tell Josh he was right. So Josh, <laughs> if you're watching, you were right. Um, and then of course, uh, getting to work with TR, that's something I've wanted to do for a very long time. He and I have wanted to work together. Um, so that this being a prime vehicle for that, um, just, just irresistible and sort of kismet. So question for both of you, what is your favorite line in the play? Claren, I'm at a loss. Uh, you go first. <laughs> I, have, I have so many. I have so many and I just, so many of them are spoilers oh, okay. uh, in some ways, but, but I will say uh, the one that made me laugh first when I first read it, it made me actually laugh out loud um, and you need the context uh, but Naomi says I think my swing set is broken now um, and you'll need the context to get that but that made me laugh out loud um, and then uh, one is and you need the context for this too is I will remember hmm. And mine, I'm not going to give it away because it's a spoiler, but, you know, one of the, the um, premises of the, the, the play is Matthew really has an idea of what David 
is and could be and should be. Um, and there's a comparison. And when they, they have, a, there's a scene, kind of a climactic scene between the two of them, which where Nelson Mandela is invoked. Uh, and I'm only gonna say that much, um, but whenever I get to that, um, I just get, I get kind of goose flesh. It's like, oh boy, okay. Those are gifts, you know, it's sort of like, when you were a kid out in the yard with a mason jar catching fireflies, <laughs> sometimes you catch one, and that's and it. Boy, did it happen then! So you know that's that's beyond me. So I'm not tooting my own horn here. And I have another favorite line, but I'm not. Oh, oh, in that sequence, <laughs> I just I just have to. Mm, yes, goose flesh as well. What is your vision for the production, Claire? And what should your audience expect? That's a good. Are you are you talking like visually, or are you talking conceptually? Because um, yes, however you want to take it. <laughs> um. Well, uh, since this is the f this is the world premiere, this is the first production um, of of this piece, and so what's really important to me as a director working with a new piece and working with the playwright um, is to show the playwright what they've got. So to um, right to execute the the vision that's coming out of the text, and um, that's not to say that I haven't had my little moments, right? Um, little directorial license moments, but um, but I want I want you to see the story uh, that Michael has brought to us and and hear the beautiful language. Now, um, the set is a beautiful apartment, um, and what I and so you'll enjoy that. It'll be a feast for the eyes. Right, um, but what's most important to me um, is what I, I want the audience to see living, breathing people um, experiencing a real, real wonderful and difficult um, and all the highs and lows, all those difficult things, those wonderful things. I forgot to add, add a, a noun earlier, so I gotta come back and get that noun in there. Um, yeah, I, I want them to live and breathe through this play, mm -hmm. along with the along with the actors, um, because it's a it's it's a really wonderful journey um, to have been on um, as as a director and as a cast and as a crew. Um, and we really, really want to bring the audience in on that journey now. We are so excited for you to travel with us over the course of the evening. Michael, that... to piggyback on that question, what do you want your audience to be thinking about after the show ends? Michael, I'm going to give that to you if I can. Um, wow, that's there. That there's a lot in that. Obviously, I want them to think about LGBT rights. I want them to think about. I want. I want people to examine their barriers. Um, you know, we all. You know, what's interesting about this is that um, since this, I had a reading a, a few years ago at Forward Theater in Madison, Wisconsin which was excellent. Um, and the difference between then and now is uh, white privilege is on everyone's radar. And I remember having arguments with people years ago saying, well, I don't have white privilege, you know? You know, I, you know, I, you know, it's like, oh my God, you know, and there was no, no acknowledgement of systemic racism or anything like that. Um, so I think I've hopefully humanized and humorously kind of shown too just the foibles of, of you know, the two characters, the Americans in this too, who they're so well intentioned and they are, you know, good people, um, but boy, they have their blinders in certain areas too. And it's not uh, an attack on white liberalism. Um, but I, I'd like to say I've kind of gently <laughs> tweaked it. Um, and uh, so I want people to kind of examine their own things and what their own uh, blocks are too. I mean, another theme in this is destiny too, where, you know, David takes a real leap of faith. And I think we've all done this in our life too, where you follow your heart and sometimes your heart takes you to a place to have an experience, but it's not 
it's all the same path. You're going in the same direction, but you have to kind of go, you know what, this isn't right. You know, this is, is this really working? Is this really serving me? Um, so, I, you know, I'd like people to kind of reflect too on their choices and, and uh, you know, again, race, but also, um, you know, and the issues at hand, but also interpersonal relationships, like where, where are our blocks? And I think too, we see the static that goes on in the relationship as it evolves, but there's great love underneath it too. And I think it, it's always important to remind people that while people may have their kerfuffles and, and you know, things had dust ups, um, many times underlying that is great, great love and deep love and, and, you know, finding the right shape for a relationship. I mean, sometimes, you know, we think we found the one and only, is it? Um, maybe there's a more appropriate shape for the relationship. So it's, it's a lot. I know I'm going on and on, but so it's not just one thing. I don't want them going away thinking, oh, okay, this. Um, I, I want them to be kind of in the pot with a lot of ingredients stirring around. Awesome. So my last question for you, is there somebody in the audience and they're just mesmerized by the show and they want to follow in your footsteps? What advice would you give another playwright watching your show? I would say go for it, write from your heart, write a play that only you can write. Um, it's, it's just gotta, it, it can, my criteria is, is that you have to find something that's so personal and so something that only could have come from you. That's where you go. And, and the other part of the advice is have a day job <laughs> <laughs> or be married to someone in healthcare. Um, I'm not married to anyone in healthcare, uh, but I have a, I have a business that I, I run and um, that's allowed to sustain me because the reality is unfortunately uh, in theater now, I think maybe 50 years ago, conceivably you could make a living as a playwright. Um, and I think unless you write a hit musical on Broadway that's licensed all the time, um, you know, because even produced playwrights who've had Broadway productions have to teach. Um, it's, not, it's not something you can make a living doing and no one tells you that. Um, and it's not impossible, but I would say don't have an expectation that you're going to have a breakout play and suddenly you're going to be wealthy. And, you know, theater, the theater is in a really bizarre place right now. COVID did not help. Um, but the corporatization of theater um, has contributed to, you know, the, the, the artists are suffering, um, especially when the corporate interests have hold more sway. Claren, is there anything you would like to add to our preview of the show? Actually, there are a couple of things. <laughs> um, and and they're, just, they're just things I want to get out there. So uh, Michael has graciously agreed uh, to join us for a post-show conversation on Friday. Oh, nice. So if you're interested in that, you might want to come see the show on Friday. Um, and that's part of a larger initiative. Um, Outcast is hosting community conversations after every show um, with uh, special guests, depending on the evening, uh, in part because we believe, um, just like just like Michael said, that we, we don't want you to walk away with just one thing. Um, and we want to be able to talk to our community about what they experienced um, and what happened and, and to talk about maybe what they can do um, if they if they see something that they they feel needs addressing. So um, so that's going to happen after every show and it, you stay tuned and you'll you'll learn who will be joining us as our special guests. Um, I think that post goes out on Facebook tomorrow. Um, the one the other thing that is happening, and I, I believe we've confirmed this, is at the Sunday matinee, Metro Health will be um, offering free HIV testing. Oh, wow. So that's a community partnership um, that we're working on uh, to offer that. Because again, we, we really believe that theater has to be connected uh, with its community um, and, and help connect folks to the services they need. Um, not just talk about them. So um, that's one one piece. And then the other thing I want to bring up is Outcasts Community Access Program. So uh, our our feeling is that equity requires access. 
So the Community Access Program is a, a way in which we are able to offer reduced uh, cost as well as an up to and including free tickets um, for underserved folks. So if the last thing you need to be worrying about is the cost of a theater ticket right now. You can check out the community access program on our web page. Uh, all you've got to do basically is send us an email to the to cap at outcasttheater.org. Tell us, tell us what you want to pay for a ticket, including nothing. We send you a promo code, and that's it. We're not um, we're not trying to uh, evaluate need. Nobody needs to demonstrate anything like that. We figure folks want to pay for art when they can, um, and if they can't, we still we still want you. Um, if you if you're feeling outcast financially, that come come be with us, and we're able to do that um, because folks. Uh, sponsor those tickets because we pay our artists and we need to do that but um, but many of us really believe that uh, folks need to have access to live performance regardless of financial situations so community access program come check us out ask us for a ticket we want to give them to you awesome thank you so much guys I really really well, can I just you. add one last thing yes, yeah sure. Absolutely. I would just say, please, people in the Tampa area, support this group. Outcast Theater Collective is amazing. Um, you know, with, with Black Lives Matter really coming on the radar in a major way in the last few years, uh, theater companies across the country have been scrambling to uh, uh, post their, you know, Black Lives Matter manifestos on their web pages and things like that. And, you know, here is a group, if you go to the um, Outcast Theater's uh, website, um, and look at the roster, the faces of the people. This is this is what true diversity is. And whereas other places, it's people of color and marginalized voices asking for a place at the table. This group has built their own table, and they're asking us all to join them at that table. Please, people in Tampa, this is an amazing group. And, and as Linda Lohman says, in Death of a Salesman, attention must be paid. We have to support this. This is important work. These are important people. These are important voices. Support these people. They're fabulous. Do you want to be featured on Behind the Curtain? Email Deb Kelly at BehindTheCurtainTampa at gmail.com to schedule your interview.